Well, good morning to uh, everyone here. If this is your first or second time here, we want to welcome you. My name is Rick, and I typically preach here on Sunday mornings. And as our guest, we want to let you know that we have a gift for you out of our uh, out of our out at our Welcome Center. Um, So if you'll take the connection card that's on the back of your chair, fill out that information, take it to our Welcome Center after service. Uh, We'd love to bless you with a gift and get to know you, and thank you for being here. So today we are beginning this series called Wonder, and in its apologetic series, it's going to be talking about whether or not God exists. I think it's probably one of the greatest questions that any of us could ask. Is God's existence true? Better yet, is truth even knowable? And often, if if you're a Christian or you've been a Christian for any amount of time, maybe you have been confronted with these types of challenges, maybe within your own mind or own heart, um, in your family, at work. And so, typically as a Christian, when people don't believe in God, we say something like this, well, the Bible says. Well, often I've discovered that people, if they don't believe in God, the last thing they're going to believe in is the Bible. I mean, why would they believe whether or not the Bible is true and, or accept anything that the Bible has to say if they don't even believe that God exists? Furthermore, if they don't believe that God exists, maybe they are someone who is skeptical about everything. And so they don't even believe whether or not truth exists. Is truth something that is knowable? Is truth something that can be discovered? <coughs> what even is the nature of truth? And so if we are going to get people and convince them through persuasive arguments and evidence that the resurrection of Jesus Christ really did take place, we probably should be able to have a good understanding of whether or not the Bible is trustworthy. And that is built upon whether or not God exists. And that is built upon whether or not truth exists. There's a famous Christian philosopher, his name is Ronald Nash, and he's written several books. If you're taking notes, that's somebody's name that you want to write down. If you want to start reading a little bit more about philosophy and reasonable faith and whether or not Christianity is true. But he tells of a story of a student who had come home, he was at uh, Bowling Green University, and he decided to come home and visit a church while he was on break. And the minister of the congregation got up (laughs) and he said, the sermon today is going to be about how all religions are true. Everybody has the truth, you have a little bit of your truth, they have a little bit of their truth, but at the end of the day, we are all going to the same place. And so he preached his sermon, and the college student, when he heard what the sermon was going to be, immediately he thought of something in his mind that contradicted that. But like most people, he wasn't going to ruffle the feathers, he wasn't going to cause any trouble, and so, like maybe some of you here today, you're just going to slip out, and you're going to get out of here before you're asking any questions, right? Totally get it, understand. Well, before he was able to slip out, Ronald Nash tells the story, before he was able to slip out, the minister grabbed a hold of him, went right after him, saw that he was new, and welcomed him to the church, and asked him how he enjoyed the sermon. And the young man from Bowling Green was a little quiet, and he said, well, actually, I kind of have a a little bit of a problem with what you said. And the minister said, well, that's okay, you can share anything. You know, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and we can all talk together. And the young college student looked at him and said, my truth says that you're going to hell. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and the minister was, he got red in the face, and he was like, oh, well, 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 well maybe, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe you don't have the truth, and maybe truth is exclusive. And that's what we will find when we talk about this idea of truth, and this idea, is all truth relative? Does everybody have the truth? And initially, doesn't it kind of sound arrogant to say, well, I've got the truth, and you don't? Kind of sounds arrogant, doesn't it? But unfortunately, that's the way the truth operates. Lecrae said this in one of his songs. Lecrae is a Christian artist. He, he raps this. He says, if what's true is true for you and what's true is true for me, what if my truth says that your truth is a lie? Is it still true? And then, of course, he goes, come on, man. I mean, that just doesn't even make sense. If we were to find truth, we would say truth is something like this, telling it like it is. Now, truth isn't a thing. Truth isn't you can't go out and find it. It's not this object that you can get a hold of and put inside of your bag. Truth is more, it's a concept, it's an idea. Truth should be thought of like this. Truth is a property as corresponding with reality. Truth is a property with corresponding to reality. Truth is when a stated proposition matches up with factual reality. Like for instance, Rick is a good looking guy, right? (laughs) That is true. I'm just kidding. You're like, well, that's subjective truth, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. 
So truth is simply, it is a, a proposition of sentences indicating their correspondence with reality. I like the way Frank Turek and Norman Geisler characterize truth. They have a book that they've written, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It's a really good book if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, if you're trying to figure out this thing out. They, they, they have been able to kind of put together a pretty good argument for the truthfulness of Christianity. And in their chapter on truth, they say this, truth can also be defined as that which corresponds to its object or that which describes an actual state of affairs. They go on to say if something is true, it is true for all people at all times and all places, and that all truth claims are absolute, narrow, and exclusive, right? So if I say something like this, for instance, I like chocolate ice cream, that's what's true for me. It is objectively true at this time, in this point in time, for Rick Bonifield, that Rick Bonifield's favorite ice cream is chocolate. Even though subjectively chocolate is my favorite ice cream and maybe vanilla is your favorite ice cream, it's still objectively true that chocolate is my favorite ice cream and it's still objectively true that chocolate is your, or vanilla is your favorite ice cream, right? It's objectively true. To be objectively true means it's true regardless of human opinion. Now, as a Christian, I always think it's important when we talk about this idea of truth. I do believe the Bible is the true word of God. And so I always try to get back to the word of God to define this thing that we call truth. For instance, when Angel and I are in an argument, I'm already smiling. When Angel and I are in an argument and we have a disagreement about something, I like to quote scripture to her, right? Because God's word is true. So for instance... (laughs) John 18, 37, we'll disagree about something. Then I say this, everyone who belongs to the truth hears my voice. (laughs) It's so bad if you really think about how bad that is. I also will quote John 8, 46 and 47. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. And the reason you do not hear is you do not belong to God. Wouldn't that be awful? Now, I lied, okay? I do not say that to Angel. That would be totally messed up, right? He who hears the truth hears my voice. So that's taking the truth out of context. That's ripping it out and abusing it and manipulating it. And we don't want to do that. I will be the first one to admit that I don't know all there is to know about reality and about arguments for the existence of God. Simply put, I believe it's more probable that God exists than not. But that is built upon the foundation of what I believe about the truth. Now, the Bible does have a lot to say about truth. For instance, the Bible talks about how Jesus, um, even by his own enemies, they, they said, we recognize that you have the way of God in accordance with the truth. John, in his gospel, in John chapter 1, he describes Jesus as somebody who had grace and truth. In John seventeen seventeen, Jesus says of God, God, thy word is truth. Hebrews sixteen eighteen says that it's impossible for God to lie. And as as Christians, we are commanded to worship God in spirit and in truth. Simply put, Christianity is a thinking religion, not just an emotional religion. It's not just something that you feel. It is something that you rationally hold to be true. But the Bible also says that our world went wrong. And because man has an insatiable desire for sin, the Bible says man has suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And in forsaking this truth, the world has lost their love because the Bible says love rejoices in truth, not in iniquity. And finally, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says God desires for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If God does exist, the Bible is emphatically clear that God wants us to know and experience the truth. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to lay hold of this idea of the truth about reality. And one of the ways that we can discover the truth about God is what's called the general book of Revelation, or in other words, natural theology. It's when even if we don't look in the Bible for the truth about God, we can look to the world around us and using logic and reason and discovering the truth of our reality, we can come to objective truths about the existence of God and the nature of truth. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim his work. When we look out in creation and we want to discover this idea of truth, the Bible says when we look out to the skies, when we look at nature, we see a certain nature and a certain truth about the glory of God. When we talk about truth, 
the pioneers of the modern scientific discovery, people in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, they had certain beliefs about the nature of truth. First of all, they believed that truth could be discovered. For instance, before Isaac Newton discovered gravity, for instance, did gravity exist before then? Well, certainly it did. Why? Because truth about our reality can be discovered. Truth is also transcultural. Two plus two equals four in any time and any place for any culture. Truth is always truth, even if your culture does change. Third of all, they believe that truth was unchanging even if our beliefs about the world change or about truth change. Let me give you a perfect example. Sorry, flat earthers, okay? Just because, just because we got more evidence and understanding about the roundness of the world, right? But even though they believed the earth was flat several hundreds of years ago, that doesn't change the nature of truth. The world is still round regardless of whether or not we believe that it's flat or round. Truth is objective. Number four, truth is not affected by the attitude of the one professing it. Even if I don't like the, flat, the fact that truth does exist, and that truth can be discovered, and whether or not God does exist or the world is round, just because I might not like those things or I might be prejudiced against those things does not mean truth doesn't still exist. And number five, all truths are absolutely true even if they appear to be relative. As I said, my favorite ice cream <coughs> excuse me, is chocolate. That is objectively true that Rick Bonifield's favorite ice cream is chocolate in this time, in this place. And so we cannot escape the nature of truth. I'd like to share a little bit with you this morning about the historical basis for truth in science. Because a lot of people have this misconception about reality that science is in conflict with faith. And that faith is belief in spite of evidence and science is belief because of evidence. And that is absolutely not true. The greatest scientists that the world has ever known, the founders of our modern scientific movement, were believers that God did exist and because their belief in God, that he did exist, they viewed that as a framework and a ground for discovering their scientific truths. Let me give you a few examples. First of all, here's what they believed. Number one, they believed that the universe can be understood. In other words, truth can be known. Number two, they believed that human beings can understand it. We possess the ability to understand the truth around us, whether that's science or religious truth. And number three, it is good to understand the truth. Knowing the truth about things is a good thing. So let me, let me share with you a few examples. First of all, many of you might know Nicholas Copernicus. He had a publication on the heavenly spheres. Here's, he's one of the greatest scientists ever known to man. Here's what he said. To know the mighty works of God, to comprehend his wisdom and majesty and power, to appreciate in degree the wonderful workings of his laws. Surely all this must be a pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the most high God, to whom ignorance cannot be more gratifying than knowledge. Thanks. His scientific research was grounded in his belief and worship of God. And he's a scientist. Tycho Brahe. He spent decades recording um, um, the astronomy data, data with measurements five times more accurate than the measurements available to him during his time. The guy was a super genius. He says, those who study the stars have God for a teacher. He studied the stars because he wanted to know from God himself. Galileo, many of us might know his name. He was the father of modern observational astronomy. He says, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with a sense of reason and intellect has intended us to forgo its use. We should use the brains, he said, that God has given us to understand the world around us. Johannes Kepler, he was a German mathematician, an astronomer, an astrologer. He says, since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, creation in other words, it befits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else, the glory of God. This super genius, in other words, says, when we start contemplating these wonderful truths of the universe around us, he says it causes us not to think about how wonderful our minds are, but ultimately reflecting the mind of our creator. 
Pascal. Many of you might know that name, Pascal's Wager. Maybe you've heard that before. He was a mathematician, a philosopher, a physicist, and a pioneer of the probability theory. He says there are two kinds of people we can call reasonable. Those who serve God with all their heart because they know him, and those who seek him with all their heart because they do not know him. Once again, his belief in God grounded his idea that the truth about the world around him can be known. And finally, Robert Boyle, he's the father of modern chemistry and he's a pioneer of the experimental method. He said this, the vastness and beauty and orderliness of heavenly bodies, the excellent structure of animals and plants and other phenomena of nature justly induced an intelligent, unprejudiced observer to conclude a supreme, powerful, just, and good author. When he says, I study the design of the world around us, I am I conclude without prejudice that there is a greater being above us and he is powerful and just and good, not just some impersonal force. It is an absolute powerful truth that modern science began with theists who grounded their discovery about the world around them in belief in God. God was the motivating factor. But what about atheism? I personally believe that atheism is irrational. Because atheism isn't interested in truth. It has certain assumptions, a certain groundwork, a certain framework that it begins from that makes its conclusions, or even believing atheism to be true, irrational. Let me give you three reasons. Number one, atheism does not assume rationality, but chance. What happened to us is a grand accident. It is mere statistical probability. Here's what Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist, has to say. He says, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason for it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect it. If there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. The assumption of atheism does not go off of order and intentionality and truth can be known. It relies on this framework of chance. Now, there's some problems with with this idea. The first problem is that it has an assumption upon a metaphysical hypothesis. Let me share with you what I mean. If we have come to being through mere chance... That would imply that an actual infinite number of randomly ordered universes, and maybe we even call it a multiverse, actually does exist. Do you know what the problem with that is? There's no evidence that a multiverse exists. There's no evidence that points to a random number of ordered universes. We don't don't have anything about that. It's a mere metaphysical hypothesis. The second problem with that is that it relies upon the idea of an actual infinite. Well, actual infinites don't actually exist. Infinites, when we talk about the idea of infinites, we are talking about ideas, not actual reality. Mathematicians have recognized that an infinite number of things leads to self-contradiction. Let me give you a perfect example. Say I have an infinite amount of coins and I remove three. How many do I have? I have infinite. Say I, remove, say I have an infinite amount of coins and I remove 500. How many do I have? Infinite. Say I have an infinite number of coins and I remove infinite. How many do I have? Infinite. It's, it's just logically incoherent. It doesn't make sense. And that's why David Hilbert, a mathematician of the 20th century, wrote this. The infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provided a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinites to play is solely that of an idea. Infinites do not exist, right? They're just, they're just ways for us to construct mathematical uh, truths, if you will, in that, in that way. And so this idea of an infinite number of chances have brought this world into existence is just irrational. That's one of the problems with atheism. That's why physicist P.C.W. Davies, when he calculated that the odds against these initial conditions, right, there were initial conditions put in that makes our reality or our world an actual existing world. There, there, Hugh Ross is a very famous scientist. He's calculated that there were over 100 of these initial conditions set in Law of gravity, for instance, 
um, that were set in in order for our universe to have a, a life-giving universe. This is what Davies calculated, this physicist. He said that in order for these initial conditions to be put in, and for these initial conditions to be suitable for even star formation, right? If we don't have star formation, you, planets cannot exist. The earth doesn't exist. He says it would be one and at least one in a thousand billion billion zeros. In other words, for our universe to come into existence by mere chance is mathematically insane, improbable, would not happen. And so not only do we have a good philosophical argument against chance, but we also have a good rational, founded, mathematical argument against this idea of chance. It can't happen. Number two, atheism does not assume we can understand the universe. Here's what many people don't really recognize. If we believe that evolutionary naturalism is true, as an atheist, atheism is inherently deterministic. Because if you believe that evolutionary naturalism is true, you believe that you are a product of chance, of random evolution, biological complexity. And so here's the problem, right? If our existence is dependent upon survival and not discovering truth, we've got a big issue. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write this name down. His name is Alvin Plantiga. He is the greatest known philosopher of our time. He's a Christian. He teaches at Notre Dame University. Uh, Last year, I believe last year, the year before that, he won a million-dollar prize. It's called the Templeton Prize for his work in philosophy. The guy is a super genius. And he has an airtight argument against the truth of evolutionary naturalism. The basic idea is this. If one believes in evolutionary naturalism, one believes that one's own thoughts are the product of natural selection and random mutation. Your thoughts are not the product of truth. Your thoughts are not the product of rationality. And it's self-defeating. Because if your biology is ingrained in you to just survive and not discover truth, how can we trust that what you believe about reality is actually true? Is it just a survival mechanism? Is it just something that you need in order to exist? And so if our biology is inherently deterministic, in other words, your biology determines what you think because all you are are mere molecules in motion. You're not rational thought. You don't have a mind. You have a brain. You have biology. If that's the conclusion of evolutionary naturalism and you believe that this is true, then you have a really good reason to doubt your reasoning faculties. Think about it. Why should we trust? That your biology is true over another person's biology. They're not interested in truth. They're interested in survival. And so Alvin Plantinga has not been able to be answered on this. He has an airtight argument against it that you have a very powerful reason to doubt evolutionary naturalism. Otherwise, you're just mere biology. It's so certainly true in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 that there is a way that seems right. But in the end, the Bible says it leads to death. Finally, number three, atheism does not assume that it is good to know the universe. Think about it. To understand mathematics, to understand time or stars or the nature of the reality around us, there's no practical or survival benefit to the early discoveries of science. There's no point in it. Why would atheism assume that it would be good to discover these things? It's simply mere biology and we are here to survive. Now, here's what I'm not saying. If you've joined us this morning, you're an atheist, or maybe you've struggled with whether or not God does exist, I am not saying that you are an irrational person. I am not saying that you are stupid and I am smart. I'm not saying that I have all the facts and you don't, and I'm always right and you're wrong. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm attacking is a certain idea. I could be wrong, but let's follow the evidence where it leads. What is the truth about this situation? And so I believe that even atheists or Christians are created in the image of God. They have minds that they use. And let's let's be honest. Some atheists that exist today have given us some of the most wonderful, beautiful information that we could ever know about the world around us. Because they do believe these Christian ideas. The problem is, is that at the end of the day, they've still rejected belief in God. Here's what Isaac Newton had to say. He was a physicist. He co-discovered calculus. He's considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, scientists in history. He says, atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. This is what the original scientific movement believed. This is what these guys held to. And so the truth does exist. 
The truth is something that we can know. The truth is something that corresponds to reality. It makes better sense to understand the world around us off of the fact that God does exist and the truth can be known rather than God does not exist and the truth can't be known. But let me give you some, be- some mere basic contradictory statements that you might hear all of the time. And maybe some of these things are things that you think yourself. Now, I like to text people, right? Everybody texts. That's what we do in the 21st century. And so uh, it's okay if you don't because it's not a big deal. But when I text, sometimes we get in conversations with different people. And I had someone that was texting me about whether or not God does exist and truth can be knowable. And let me show you some of the basic contradictory statements that people often believe. Hit that first text message slide for me, uh, if you will, please. Have you ever heard this, for instance? There is no truth. What's the question that you ask? Well, is that true? And so if you have these claims in your mind, what I want you to do is I want you to take that claim and apply it to itself. If it's true that there is no truth, then it can't be true that there is no truth because it's self-contradictory. How about this one? You can't know the truth. Well, how do you know that? Doesn't make sense. It's irrational. How about this one? One of my favorites. All truth is relative. Is that a relative truth? Because if that's a relative truth, then that means all truth is relative. Is it true? It's only relative. Number four, look at this one. It's true for you, but not for me. Is that true for everyone? Because if it's true for you and not true for me, it's true for everyone. Then it's true for you and not true for me isn't true. Because it's true for everyone. These are irrational thoughts that, look, they sound really, really good. You've got a philosopher or a scientist or somebody that you really respect, and they say something like this, you're like, man, that's, that sounds pretty good. But then when you apply the claim to itself, you're like, wow, this actually really doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> How about this one? No one has the truth. Is that true? Because if it's true that no one has the truth, then how do you know that that's true? And that means that it's not true. How about this one? The scientific method is the only means of knowing truth. Interesting. How did you arrive at that truth? Was it through the scientific method? Did you place that truth statement under a magnifying glass? How did you arrive at it? No, that's a philosophical idea that you've approached science with. How about this one? Well, you can't know anything for sure. Do you know that for sure? irrational, contradictory. And finally, look, I get it. If, if you're an atheist, there are Christians who do come across as arrogant and mean-spirited, and you don't really want to have a conversation with them. And look, I'm speaking majorly and majorly to my Christian fellow brothers and sisters, and so I can be a little bit more free. But when I'm talking with people, it's really, really important not to come across as an arrogant jerk, right? And so really the last charge, and you often hear this in the classroom, is you are so arrogant. You are so judgmental. How are you claiming that you have the truth and I don't? That, your truth isn't true. How do you respond to that? Isn't that a judgmental statement? And why are you jud- uh, statement? Why are you judging me for judging you? Why are you saying that I'm not true? Are you claiming that to be the truth? Are you claiming that you have the truth? And so at the end of the day, when we talk about this nature of truth, it is very, very important for us to understand this. False ideas about truth lead to false ideas about life. Is it possible to know the truth? Yes, it is. And if God does exist, is it possible to know a way to him? And the answer is yes. Jesus proclaimed to be the embodiment of the truth. He says this in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so we've got some biblical revelation that Jesus had to say about the truth. Is it possible to know the truth? How do I get to eternal truth? And Jesus responds with three things. Number one, I am the truth. I am the opposite of falsehood. Truth is a stated proposition that matches up with factual reality. And when Jesus claimed to be the truth, he claimed to be that which matches up with reality. In Greek philosophy, truth was to get to the nature of the real being. It's to get to the essence of an object. And so to know the truth is to know Jesus as a person. The embodiment of God. 
Jesus, Jesus is the truth persona, personified. He's the truth in the flesh. And when we know the truth and we really understand who Jesus is and we believe it with all of our hearts, we can stake our lives upon the truth. That this thing that we call Christianity is not just my truth or your truth. It is the truth. And Jesus Christ himself claimed to be the embodiment of that truth. And we should follow him if he is the truth. Number two, he said, I am the way. I am the road. I'm the path. I'm the highway. Metaphorically speaking, Jesus claimed to be the single road that leads to God. There aren't many paths that lead to God, according to Jesus. There's only one, and that's through a relationship with him. That's what we should trust. He has not come to show a better way to God. He has come to show there is no other way to God. And number three, Jesus says, I am the life. I'm not just biological viability, but I am true eternal life. I am supernatural life. I am transcendent life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. And so I pray that you leave here this morning understanding the proper definition of truth. Fully believing with the evidence that we have up here that there is good historical grounding for the nature of truth, that it can be discovered and known and made real, and that science is not in conflict with faith. Faith in God, belief in God, was the driving, motivating factor for discovering these incredible truths about our reality. Don't, be, don't fall prey and captive to people who have these really cool, catchy statements But at the end of the day, violate the basic idea of the law of non-contradiction. They are just irrational. And finally, if truth can be known, God does or does not exist. It's either true or it's either false. Next week, we're going to be able to give you just two evidences for the existence of God. There are more good arguments and evidence for the existence of God. So we want to invite you back next week. Um, We're going to have uh, a very good message and some great information and resources available to you. But I'd like to end this morning with a story. One uh, moral dilemma question or this idea of truth as relative is something that you often find in the classroom, philosophy, scientific classroom. And maybe you've heard this before. That imagine a gigantic elephant in the room, and there are six men around the elephant. The problem is is that they're all blind. And each man goes up to feel a different part of the elephant. And one feels a tail, other one feels a leg, one feels the snout, one feels the ear, one feels the gigantic body. And they come away with all these different truths about what they are feeling and what they experience. And one says, this is a rope. Another one says, this is a hose. Another one says, this is a tree. Another one says, this is kind of a furry animal. And who knows what the other one says? The ear, right? Elephant ear. I do like those. They're delicious. But anyways, I know. Donut elephant ears. I just can't get off food, guys. I'm sorry. Struggle. Anyway, so everybody's got a piece of the truth, right? Because all truth is relative. And at the end of the day, everyone's getting at the same truth, even if they come at it from a different angle. Doesn't that sound really good? right? Doesn't that prove the point that all truth is relative? Well, here's one problem, is that while we have the different perspectives of the six men feeling the elephant, there's one perspective that the person telling the story often doesn't give, and that's the perspective of the storyteller, the person who sees the objective truth, the person who sees the blind man feeling the different parts of the elephants, proclaiming their part of the truth, but yet he's working from the whole story. And that's where all of us can be, Work from the whole story. Look at the evidence. Survey the facts. See what truth and science and even faith and what the Bible has to say about our reality and render your conclusion. Carl F.H. Henry taught this, that we can really know God by knowing Jesus, for Jesus is God's self-revelation, perfectly and completely revealed to us. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Have you ever seen the world?